we should be live for our next show here. Welcome everybody. This is going to be the for the week of July 5th, 2020. It is of course our weekly show talking about game design and industry topics. Joining me as always is my co-host, indie developer Sharky. How are you doing? Doing good. We uh, we're actually making progress on programming. You know, this this our current game has been just really, really uh, in a bad spot programming wise. But our last game was fine all programming wise all the way through. Just <laughs> was bad in art all the way through. <laughs> now we you were now we're good in art, but we're we're not good in programming. <laughs> if it's not one thing. It's the other thing that you didn't have problems with before. Mm -hmm. Are you off of Valve time, or are you still saying, you know, giving people soon as when stuff's going to happen? Well, I mean, things are happening already. Um, we're planning on having the first um, playtest, actual playtest, at the new dev chat that will be on uh, I think it's the 18th yeah the 18th so roughly two weeks from now on Saturday the 18th mm -hmm. we'll be doing a dev chat in our discord where we'll be playtesting nice and you know doing a little bit of the normal dev chat stuff just you know keeping that to kind of a minimum kind of thing mm -hmm. and we're swapping to two a month and you know Depending on how everything goes over, you know, till the 18th and after the 18th, we might be swapping day every week. Nice. We'll make that kind of choice potentially on the 18th, depending on how things go up to that point. Mm hmm. And you definitely want to tie in the being able to have the playable build or having some kind of build for people to check out either during the dev cast or maybe a little bit before then then people can come on and comment about it yeah we definitely want people to come in and play it and give feedback and whatnot tell us why you know what reasons you hate it for and what reasons you love it for mm -hmm. so we can fix all the th reasons that you don't that you hate it and and uh, embrace all the blazons that you love it. <laughs> if Pony is watching, we had this discussion about developers fixing issues. You know, you want to leave in the things people hate, right? You know, as long as they don't complain about it, it's perfectly fine, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, you know, I, I think I think what you need to do really is you need to find out what they hate and what they love, right? Mm -hmm. Take everything they love out and replace it with just things they hate. And don't forget, you have to you have to berate the people when they're playing the game too. Yeah, if if, if they say they don't like something, you know, just berate them hard. What we need to do is have like an April Fool's uh, show where we just give all bad advice. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do. It's gotta be Although careful. The, yeah, the 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 bad thing about that is is it, or the troubling thing is it needs to be so obvious. That's bad advice, and mm -hmm. and also, it needs to only be available on the first, and then you take it down, and then and then and then you know put it back up with a you know disclaimer. This was recorded on April first. This is an April Fool's joke before the yeah, video you starts. You know somebody's gonna say, you know, what the hell are these idiots talking about? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But in terms of news that's been happening, I finally got a haircut. My last haircut was literally in January. I think that may be the record for the longest I've gone without one. So now I'm just like paranoid if I'm going to get the virus or not. Yeah. You know. I think the I think the last haircut I got was about I don't know six years ago, seven years ago. <laughs> I was telling I my family. Hair. Well, if I do. If I do uh, end up dying, at least I'll look nice. I'll look presentable at my funeral because I had to get my hair cut. <laughs> Not necessarily because it'll it'll take you probably a week before you get infected, mm. before you actually start getting symptoms and everything, and then it'll take you probably two weeks to two months to die after that point. Right. And so, the hair will grow know, back in six days. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
So you'll you'll have you'll you'll be ready for the throw. You you'll get the throw right you know right, right. before you get sick. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, let's see. I got a copy of a Tanya Short's book on procedural generation that I'm going to read through and kind of reference for my roguelike book. And I am now just under two months away from having to get this thing done. So that's going to be exciting. <laughs> yeah, you got to get good at writing books. Mm-hmm. In terms of we're still in the middle of the Steam sale, do you pick up anything new this week? Uh, I picked up a bunch of things at the beginning of the sale. I didn't go back and get a second. Mm -hmm. I didn't double dip kind of thing. And I've been and, going uh, incrementally, like every day buying one or two games off my wish list. <laughs> I, I, I I went for the, the $30 discount thing. Mm -hmm. And then once I got that, it's like, I'm, I'm good now. That's, that's all I needed. You know, kind of rip the band-aid off and then get it over with and then don't don't touch it again. <laughs> I still have 108 games on my wish list. Maybe I get that down to 100 before the end of the week, but who knows. I know I got Dicey Dungeons, Double Dragon Neon, um... Uh, what else did I get? Oh my goodness, so many games. Yeah, so many games in my library. The two that I, I got just... got Scrap Mechanic. Hmm. Um, the, uh, there's a couple other games I got, but that's, the, that's all I can eh. pick out. The two that I just picked up, Treachery and Beatdown City and Gunfire Reborn. Gunfire, the I am really liking. There is a lot of potential here. It's essentially... Borderlands by way of a roguelike. That that doesn't make any sense. Mm-hmm. Get all the guns. It's procedurally generated world. Guns and features are unlocked as you play. There's persistence. So where's the the Borderlands in it? By the fact that your the guns are dropped with randomized modifiers. They can be customized, modified. I mean, dude, I believe did that too. <laughs> yeah. But not a first-person shooter. Well, give give Diablo time. It's a first person Diablo shooter on mobile coming. If this game can pull it all together, this could be a very impressive title for twenty twenty. They're calling it FPS roguelike RPG because they can't just say it's a role playing shooter because I think a gearbox has that copyrighted or trademark. No. Oh. Trademark in a genre name? <laughs> Uh, so there are definitely more reason to not go with Gearbox. Mm -hmm. So it definitely shows potential, but it is lacking in content. Again, it is in early access. It just went on just over like maybe a month and a half ago, maybe a little bit more than that. So could be something to keep an eye out on, especially if you're not interested in Borderlands Three. Yeah. And Treachery and Beatdown City, I am I applaud the developers for making a RPG beam up, but this isn't what I had in mind with having an RPG beat 'em up. Yeah. It it looked cheap. The pixel art looks worse than some of the NES games I think we've played. Yeah, it looked it looked like a not the worst NES game that ever came out, but one of the lower tier NES games kind of LGN thing. Like, kind of game. Yeah, it looked like LGN kind of art. And that's something that we've been saying many times over that if you're going to emulate or try to iterate on a classic platform or genre, you have to do better than those games. Mm-hmm. I don't want to play a worse version of Super Mario Brothers or Double Dragon. Yeah, and the fact is, is most consumers won't even get realize that you're imitating that. Because I meant with my last game, you know, you know, the word of the day. We're going into the word of the day already, Chromasia kind of thing. That 
the uh, that I had people saying that they liked the art because they thought it was you know it reminded them of old NES days. It's like you know that's thir- you know sixty four bit <laughs> art, right? Yeah. It's like you know none of the games in the old days ever did that. Like, especially not Nintendo, which is what he was referring to. And I was like, <laughs> no. <laughs> Again, like we were talking about on my piece about humility, the consumer doesn't care about your life story. They don't care that you painstakingly, you know, animate every character by hand. They don't care how long till you do the art. All they care about is what is on that store page. Mm-hmm. And if what they see on that store page doesn't look high quality nothing else really matters and they don't care if you purposely made it bad either Mm -hmm. definitely all they care about is you made it bad or not good enough Mm -hmm. again first impressions really do matter for a game developer Mm -hmm. we also play mortal mortal shell which is another attempt at a developer for trying to do the Souls-like. Or, I'm sorry, they call it a deep action RPG. And, yeah, I... The red flags were going off about that combat system. How deep were those red flags? (laughs) They were in the uh, muck of whatever that swamp I was in. Hi, Antonio. (laughs) Uh, Again, like, there's a topic here that I want to talk about, but I don't know how to properly phrase it. That when a developer tries to copy another design, and they intentionally do something worse, or they break what's not broken, in order to stand out. Yeah. Because, I mean, we've seen developers, you know, it's Darkest Dungeon, but like this. FTL, but like this. So, Dark Sekiro Souls. Is a, Sekiro is a good example of that. Yeah. But Sekiro's from From Software, so, I mean, they're, they're, they're allowed to break their own games. <laughs> but yeah. it's that... I mean, if, if, if I had my way, Sekiro wouldn't exist. <laughs> but it's that issue that you're trying to stand out... And you're doing it in the way of... You're ignoring the lessons that the developer made. You know, it's like, we're going to make a car, but in order to be different from everybody else, our steering wheel is going to be on the floor. You know, The stealing wheel? I mean, is that the one that they steal? Yeah. Steal that wheel from somewhere else? (laughs) (laughs) Where are they going to put the steering wheel in the trunk? Yeah, something like that. You know, it's being bold, and you know, you're being a trend center there. <laughs> I, I think somebody has actually done that before. Like they've modified mm-hmm. a car and moved the steering wheel to the trunk to be different. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. being different always means successful, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when we say, you know, I mean, we've you, we've said it many times that when you when you're you know doing a genre, do something to stand out. Don't stand out like that. Don't stand out like a sore thumb, you know? Stand out like a you know, pile of gold sitting on the sidewalk that somebody wants to pick up, not not a nail that somebody wants to step on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Let's see. Any other big games I play this week? Um, not like anything like major. So pr- playing Project Starship X... One of these nights, I'm going to have to do just an all-roguelike, or probably several nights of roguelike games, just to start getting the uh, screenshots and get more uh, inspiration for the book as well. Isn't that what you do every night? Yeah, well, I'm going to actually have to take screenshots and pay attention instead of just (laughs) trying to play the game. (laughs) I kind of stopped playing both Monster Train and Atomicron because I'm nearing the end of their ascension modes and the luck is real in terms of having any chance of surviving at that level. Hmm. Like in Monster Train, it's basically, oh, you didn't draw an amazing car in the first battle, you're done. You know, go restart. Or 
get the wrong combination, you're not you're not going to bring this together. Mm -mm. But they did announce there is going to be a free content DLC. I don't know what's going to be in it though. I I we I need to have a rant one day about people calling you know an update DLC <laughs> free DLC. It it it's an update, not not free DLC. It is an update. <laughs> All right, but let's get to some news that's been going on. We've had some very biggies drop this past week. So, what do you want to talk about first? Uh, Evo collapsing or seventy dollar AAA games? Well, since I don't know about Evo, I'll go with the uh, the sixty nine ninety nine AAA games. All right. So, for those of you who missed the announcement. 2K has announced that their next... Oh, I'm sorry. I think this is going to be the Xbox, whatever the new system is. I've locked that part the, out. The next-gen consoles. Yeah. is going to raise the price up to $69.99 as the MSRP, as opposed to $59. And this has some very interesting implications when it comes to, again what is going to be the value of a game in this decade? Because we've been, you know, hemming and hauling for the last five years about will they try and raise the price up? Publishers have been complaining about, you know, not making enough money for years now. And Yeah, they're, they, they're not happy with the billions upon billions of dollars they get. They need more. Mm -hmm. And 2K is said to be the first developer to try and pull this off. And as we all know, publishers tend to copy the successes of others. We've seen or, this. Or, it didn't even have to succeed. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they, they, they copy the people who, who make money kind yeah. of thing. And there's no doubt that if they charge $10 more for the game, they're still going to sell just as well as they were going to be before because mm -hmm. people on consoles really don't have a choice. You know, yep. they either buy the AAA games or they don't have a console kind of thing. And once one of them does it, you know, and this one's already announced that they're going to do it before they've even, you know, before the next gen's already out. Mm -hmm. So I'm betting most of them will copy that before it even comes, before the next gen consoles even come out. So I'm betting across the board, probably pretty much everything at launch is going to be sixty nine ninety nine hmm. on all consoles. And of course, this raises that ever popular question: What is the extra ten dollars actually getting you as a consumer? So it's getting you better graphics, according to them. Mm -hmm. You need but, to throw some air quotes there, if possible. Yeah. Yeah, because it's not, they're not giving you better graphics. You're getting better graphics, but you're not, they're not giving you better graphics for the, the $10. Mm -hmm. They were going to give you that better graphics, period, because that's how they're selling the game. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, aesthetics matter when it comes in, in today's market when it comes to selling games. So, in order to keep on selling games, they, they up their graphic quality and, you know, will probably lower the quality of every, you know, a lot of other things, mm -hmm. and then charge you ten more dollars. Yep. And uh, now the thing, of course, is that for you know the modern gen consoles that it's going to be priced on, it's going to still be fifty nine ninety nine. So it seems kind of like a luxury tax right now, like. It's not like they're going to add anything brand new to the game for those additional $10. Because if you remember, there was that whole push from EA for uh, Project $10. This was something that happened, I think, in the 2000s. When, if you didn't buy the game new, they were going to cut features unless you gave the developers an additional $10. And yeah, that went over that was really to, uh, well. Yeah, I think that was to address GameStop yep. selling their games used. Oh, yes. And but, you know, anybody who bought the game new from GameStop would be penalized just as much as, mm -hmm. as the ones that bought it, you know, used. Oh, yes. 
So at that point, you know, they actually made it, you know, if that would have went through and everything, that would have made, you know, it worse on them because people would be incentivized at that point to buy used mm -hmm. because they can either buy the incomplete new copy <laughs> on week two kind of thing, or they can buy all the used copies that just got turned in from week one. You know, and, and either way, they're still going to have to pay an extra 10 bucks. So why would you buy the new one? Yep. Why would you not save 10 bucks so you can get that full content for, you know, save 10, $15 by getting used, maybe even 20 and then pay the 10 extra to get it, you know, then you're saving $10 over the, the $60 cost. But, you know, at that point, it, you're paying seventy dollars instead of <laughs> to sixty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, like the publishers are saying that development costs have gone up, and you know that can certainly be true, especially you know with how the market has gone. But again, it seems like instead of trying to make games cheaper or improve, you know, the pipeline, we're just trying to charge more money and you know, get it at the end kind of thing. Yeah, and I mean, like, the the games are getting, you know, games are expensive to make and everything, and, you know, of course, if you make them, if you put more art into a more aesthetics kind of thing, more aesthetic horsepower kind of thing, that costs more money. It doesn't cost more money necessarily to do anything, you know, aesthetically pleasing. Well, I mean, it costs some money because you have to have an artist period but it doesn't necessarily cost more mm -hmm. what costs more is the horsepower I mean some of the aesthetic will, will, will cost more because I mean if you if you do something aesthetically pleasing that is two colors or four colors kind of thing that has real simple lines and everything mm -hmm. then it's going to be really cheap to make versus something you know like super high detail 2D art or, you know, something like that, you know, I mean, like... Something like a cuphead would take a long yeah. time to make, as we've seen. Yeah. And the issue, of course, that something that people have been talking about on Twitter is why not just make smaller scale AAA games? And... I think there's definitely a topic there to discuss at some point about could a AAA developer make a 5 to 10 hour game? Could they make something at a scale that could directly compete with an indie dev? I mean, they already do. They already make games that are 5 to 10 hours and then they put stuffed it full of filler to make it 40 hours. Yeah. But what do they remove that filler? And, then they'd have a lot better games. Yeah. But it, it, again, it raises that question about what exactly are you spending your money on? Because the other point, I think uh, Jim Sterling brought this up in his piece, you know, is that $10 going to go anywhere near the developers of those games? Probably not. Yeah. Probably, probably about 50 cents of it will go towards the developers. Mm -hmm. and, and the rest of the development time that it takes to get that art is going to come out of crunch. Yep. Because now it's, you know they get an extra 50 cents because not because the developers get 50, you know the developers that already worked there are going to get 50 more cents. It's that they're going to hire they're going to take that 50 cents and hire a few more people, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know, and pay, underpay them and then all of them are going to get, you know, an extra, you know, two, three months of crunch. Yeah, everyone loves crunch. Yep, and they won't get paid for it because it's crunch, you know. Mm -hmm. It's unpaid overtime. Yep. Because they get, most of them work on salaries, you know, most, most of them work on salaries and that's, mm -hmm. you know, like, it's, it's very hard to work on a salary. Oh, yes. Because salary implies that you're going to work, you're not, well, salary means you're not going to get paid for overtime at all. Yeah. 
unless there's some kind of special clause or anything, but like when you go into the game industry that's known for crunch, it's like, uh... <laughs> and why so many people, of course, you know, get out of the AAA side and go to the independent space. Mm -hmm. and I don't... I think the optimist in me thinks or hopes that this is not going to work out well, but the pessimist says they're going to get away with this. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I don't see any way they're not going to get away with this. I mean, like, everybody who plays indie games and everything are going to be, you know, repulsed by it kind of thing. <laughs> and absolutely hate it. But everybody who plays console games exclusively are just, you know, they're already sipping the Kool-Aid kind of thing. They're, they're, they're not going to, you know matter that you know already bad tasting kool-aid that they ain't like you know tastes just slightly worse and i mean we saw kind of for a period when what was it like the console games were more expensive than their pc equivalent and i mean again like pc gamers we're not paying full price for most of our games we're waiting for the sales we've got you know, Green Man, uh, GOG, Humble, uh, all those other sites. We have the gr quote unquote gray market of CD keys and such. Like, PC gamers aren't going to be spending $70 on a uh, console port anytime soon. Yeah. And the, the, I mean, the thing is, is that people who are on the consoles are, you know, locked in to this kind of thing pretty much like you're you know if you're on a console you're either going to buy a triple a game or you're not going to use your console kind of thing pretty much yeah. and the only way to escape that is to either basically give up gaming altogether and go to mobile oh yes or 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 um Hashtag mobile life, or you could you know go and try PC, but you know like PC has several bad raps that are unfair about you know like oh yeah they're hard to set up. It's like uh, no, they're not. Mm -hmm. I mean, you use a PC at home, don't you? Yeah, but it's not a gaming PC. We'll put a graphics card in there. Done. You know. <laughs> It may not be the best crap, you know, best gaming PC, but it, it is a gaming PC at that point. It's, you know, um, it, it, it's just, you know, the, you know, it, 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 it's, it's this fake stuff that kind of gets put out there that really kind of gives PC a bad rap kind of thing. I think uh, to, um, Elwood's point about used games. The only problem with that is that the industry has been really phasing that market. I mean, we can still look at used games for the older generations, but I just don't know how much longer there will be a viable used game market. Especially if, you know, the reports about going for discless disc this that was not easy to say consoles will come to uh, pass I think consoles still have a place in terms of you know a viable market and I mean the console market is like the games that have worked best for consoles at least for the longest time, just never tried to compete with a PC market. It's kind of why originally, you know, platformers, third-person action adventure games worked so well. But the issue is that as we saw kind of the, um, I'm trying to think of how I want to say it. the standardization of game pads and control schemes really did change what it meant to play these games. I mean, again, the fact that I can hook up my uh, 360 gamepad play Nintendo games on my PC is one of those strange things. If you told me as a child that would happen, I wouldn't believe you. 
Yeah, I mean, like, PC had many issues early on. I I remember playing early PC games, Diablo 2 and, you know, um, several other things, and Age of Empires and whatnot. And the issue was, is there just wasn't any games, really. And what games there was were very limited kind of thing. You know, most of them were. And, you know, it was almost like the casual market was on PC for the most part. You had your, 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 uh, like little puzzle games and your little, like, you know, um, all the little games that you would see on mobile now were on PC back then, you know, and, you know, the little, like, shoot a ball that's a color, match it up with this other color, and then bam, you know, it goes away, you know these sort of semi-Tetris like games kind of thing. Like they were all on PC for a while and I mean now you see all that stuff on mobile and everything and not not on PC really anymore. I mean again it was really Steam that really opened that thing up kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Digital distribution changed a lot. For the older people watching this again, we grew up in that period where PCs were going to die. Microsoft, you know, Xbox was going to replace it. And then all of a sudden, PCs are alive. PCs will replace consoles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and again, like I think a final point for this news piece, and then we'll move on to the other topic. That I do think that in the perfect world, games would probably cost more. I mean, we've seen this trend with indie devs pushing titles up. It, again, it used to be you know five ninety nine nine ninety nine being the average price for an indie game. That's now gone to like fifteen dollars to maybe twenty twenty four dollars. And yeah, tw- twenty four is the new fifteen. Yeah, which is a new ten dollars from several years ago. Yeah. Which is a new what six dollars from the time before that. Yeah, and I mean again, it's. Imp- like for myself, and I'm sure for you, Shark, and for the deve- for the devs watching this, it is good to give developers more money. You know, if you want your devel- if you want your favorite developer to stay in business, they need to be earning enough money to pay their bills. It's as simple as that. Yeah, but- and I tell you, there's two two main reasons why prices are going up mm-hmm. in on the indies and whatnot. Well, three main reasons. Number one, they went too low to begin with. Number two is all the cells that Steam runs and everything, mm-hmm. and the way the Steam culture works now is you wait for a sale pretty much. Yeah. So you're never going to pretty much ever sell it for that price that you you actually put on there. You're going to be you know if you put it for for twenty dollars kind of thing. People wait for ten. But you're giving fifty percent off. You're actually only selling the game for ten dollars. Yeah. But if you put it for ten dollars and you put it for for ten fifty percent off, then you're only getting five dollars for it. So like you have to mark, you have to put your game at twenty dollars now in order to get the ten dollars mm-hmm. that you were going to originally. And uh, the third point, what was the third point? Uh, uh, the fact that the store is so crowded. There's so many games now, so you're going to naturally sell less because. Other games are naturally going to sell more, you know, copies in total, kind of thing than they did previously. Every every day it gets worse. Yeah, and again, the problem when we have these discussions is that in actuality, price means nothing when it comes to a video game. Like to give you an example. Gunfire Reborn is priced at $12. When I looked up Treachery at Beatdown City, that is retail price $20. So, if you look at screenshots of those two games, one would clearly look like it had a lot more time and a lot more work put into it. Yeah. I I wouldn't say price doesn't matter, but price is not a selling point. Mm-hmm. Price is a you know is the consumer happy at the end, and and that would be evaluated by how much how good your game was that made that and in henceforth how long they played. So if 
it doesn't matter how long your game is. What matters is how long they play. Yeah. So if they're playing for five minutes and then they turn it off, kind of thing. Unless your thing was not, unless your game was ninety nine cents, there's no way they're going to be happy. Yeah. If they played for, you know, two hundred hours, pretty much whatever your price is, they're going to be ecstatically happy. I mean, mm-hmm. they could have been a two hundred dollar price game. They're going to be ecstatically happy with that purchase because they yeah. they enjoyed it thoroughly. There have been people who have left negative reviews saying, I play this game for 200 hours and I didn't get my money's worth. They are out there. I've seen them. Yeah, yeah. There, there are those people. But, like, the people I've seen like that isn't that... I haven't seen the I haven't got my money's worth. What I've seen was the, the 200 hour reviews or the 500 hour reviews or whatever that you know, on an early access game, that the developer is, you know, going to work on this feature first instead of this feature, and I want him to work on it in the other order. Mm-hmm. I think, and it's too- like, uh, no. And I think to um, uh, Worm's question, is there a solution other than? I, I just don't see there being a solution unless the industry comes up with, you know, an accepted standard price, and I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, I don't think a standard price would solve anything either. I, right now, I mean, what is, what I see is the cause of this is, number one, is if you want to sell your game, you need visually pleasing aesthetics. If you want visually pleasing aesthetics, you're probably going to have to spend more on your art budget. If you're going to spend more on your art budget, you need to sell more copies. And you need to charge more for them. Mm-hmm. And it's it's this vicious cycle and like like every game that comes out makes consumers have higher and higher expectations. So like mm-hmm. like what is you it? know what Again, like, it's an issue of what is a $20 game, you know, what makes a $20 game worth $20 versus a $10 game worth $10? Yeah, I, I picture it in 10 years from now, 10, 15, 20 years from now, people will look back on the original Ori and say that is a ugly, ugly game without <laughs> joking about it like we do. My heart is and, hurting. And, and be like, you know, like... You know, I don't mind playing ugly games like Ori. Like, mm. uh, uh... Every time you say that, I'm feeling this, like, pressure in my head. Like somebody is, you know, ch- sticking a nail in there, hammering it in. Yeah. And the the thing is, is... I'm, I'm guessing that's going to happen. And at when we get to that point, you know, kind of thing... If your game does not live up to at least Ori standards kind of thing, you're not going to sell very well. I'm cry laughing right now as you're saying that. Mm -hmm. Just make your game look like Ori, you know, that cheap looking game, or Hollow Knight. Mm -hmm. And and then they'll be like, well, they've improved art tools and made it easier to create art. (laughs) Yeah, like like, like, like maybe 5%. Just do art. It's just like, go make video game. There's your advice, yeah. everybody. If you want to be successful, go make video game. There we but go, we're done. We're kind of on this almost competition race kind of thing of escalating visuals and, you know, to get sales. And every time we escalate the, the visuals, then the consumers escalate their expectations, which means we have to escalate our visuals more, which means they escalate their... You know, and it's just a vicious cycle that we're going. We're just climbing up the steps, kind of thing. I just and, wonder, like, there's something that's been in the back of my mind. At what point will the idea of a modern retro game just be like kind of like go away in the sense that everybody who grew up playing like a NES or a SNES? is gone. Like, like imagine 60, 70 years, or, you know, 80, whatever, is still around, that people are still trying to emulate pixel art, or still trying to make a game look like a Super Nintendo title. 
I mean, like, I mean, retro back, you know, retro then will probably be like what we're making now. <laughs> a retro game will be a uh, Hollow Knight or Dark Souls or or we're trying to try it. Mm. And to For Brian's me, point, I remember I said this on a stream. Like, I remember buying Mortal Kombat two for I think it was ninety dollars back in what was I ninety three? Oh no! <laughs> oh man, yeah, it's some crazy again. Like all the kids don't believe like the old people who <laughs> play video games. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh man. But to be honest, like, like, like with my generation, I mean, like, I, I would say a good percentage of the guys, the boys, played video games when I was young. But, you know, I don't know, probably around sixth grade or so, like, they started dropping like flies and stopped playing video games. And by the time we got to high school, probably basically none of them played video games, even though they grew up on them kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, there was that period in the 90s when people expected, you know, that video games were just going to be this fad and you're going to grow out of it. I'm, I, like, for myself, like, I'm the only member of my family who's stuck with video games. Everybody moved on to sports and other stuff. And, you know, the culture has really changed in the last 15 years. Yeah, to where now kids grow up and, and it's almost expected of them to play video games. I mean, the fact that, again, like, the, the very fact that colleges are offering eSports scholarships, you know, is such a, you know, if you would have said that to people, like, 20, 30 years ago, nobody would believe you. That I honestly don't believe it now. <laughs> I wonder how long it's going to stick around, because I, I have a feeling it's not going to stick around. I hope it does. But it actually, I think that's a really good segue into the other news piece. And that is, of course, the complete dissolve of Evo that happened this past week. So, for the people somehow watching us who have no idea what Evo is, Evo is, of course, the yearly grand fighting game uh, tournament held in Las Vegas. It is probably the most recognizable of the esports tournaments, at least among like mainstream consumers. It has routinely brought in people from all around the world. It's been one of the mainstays of the fighting game community for the last, I think it's been over 20 years. I think Evo was founded in the mid-90s. And the first kind of big hit to Evo came, of course, with the whole pandemic going on, them going to be virtual. And then it was revealed this past week that one of the co-founders had numerous sexual abuse allegations and nasty stuff that we can't really mention, you know, on a stream without YouTube completely demonetizing this. And... he It led to not only him being ousted as CEO... But multiple companies pulling out. NetherRealm, Bandai Namco, Capcom, major uh, competitors stop, or major people who are going to perform or compete there were pulling out. And basically, as of right now, Evo is dead. And this is a very, this is one of those very strange things about when it comes to esports. Because it's kind of like the same. <coughs> Oh, excuse me. It's kind of like the same thing with doing YouTube or Twitch as a living. That you are basing your job or your brand on a third party. So what happens when that like third YouTube? party goes under? Or Mixer? Yeah. Well, Mixer, I think, already went under. They, they tied it. Yeah, under. exactly. Yeah. So, Hence the example. And this is, again, that very weird thing about video games. Or about making a living kind of horizontally to the video game industry. You know, as a journalist, streamer, esports player, whatever. Is that your income and your, well, your livelihood is based on somebody else. 
So for all those uh, uh, big name competitive fighting game players, you know those who are par professional teams, what happens to them? Well, it's it's less that they're they're dependent on somebody else. It's more that they're dependent on like several somebody else. They're depending mm. on the the publisher, the developer, the sponsors, the, the sponsors, the 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 uh, the uh, you know um, convention or whatever uh, group mm -hmm. teams. You know all that kind of thing. They're they're dependent on a lot of things. They they are. Mm -hmm extremely volatile kind of thing like if one chain in that one mm -hmm. one link in that chain breaks they're done oh yes um look at i mean look at fortnite for instance like fortnite is right now the 800 pound gorilla and people are using it for everything from esports to using the crea mode for teaching and so on and so forth and there are companies and there are people who are trying to make that legitimate and <laughs> and you maybe think of something else what happens if the developer goes into a controversy like a blizzard controversy you know mm -hmm. with china and then that kills the game oh yes you know there there's there's another link in that chain like there's so many links in that chain making esports like the most volatile unsafe place you can do i mean like just imagine if you just you know like you had a bad day and your performance is off that day you would get fired over that oh yes and what happens of course as you said what if this big game that attracts a lot of people the developers just one day say you know what we're done we're moving on to something else or we're selling the game to another developer or another studio we're not making well, we this love game yeah it's it's a very it's the same thing with like YouTube and Twitch. Uh, you are relying on a lot of other people to make your livelihood, and it's very risky. Yeah, I, I can imagine during the whole China controversy with Blizzard and everything, everybody who streamed any of their games during that point mm -hmm. probably got just a load of hate. Oh, yes. But they were so locked into it because they were either practicing for esports or they were... You know, they were a dedicated streamer, and that's the only game they streamed kind of thing, and they were screwed. Yeah. And that's another... What you just said there is a very big point. Many of the top players are dedicated to their respective games. You have to be if you want to be on the top 1% of that player base. You know, I hope you really like playing Counter-Strike or LOL. That's going to be your game, you know, 18 to 20 hours a day when you're training. So... What happens if those games go under, or if a controversy shuts down a major uh, tournament? Yeah, can I be an esports player for for seven days to die and oxygen not included? <laughs> Man, I sure. have all the hours in both of those. Mm -hmm. It really reminds. It's kind of like I've been thinking about this similarly with the uh, speed running, and if speed running will become more of a profession now that it's gaining more notoriety and like speedrunning is arguably safer than you know playing like at an esports level but it's still very much like up in the air like where does that money come from if there is money because the major thing about speedrunning right now is that it is being done primarily for charity what if somebody sets up a tournament or, you know, sets up something saying, you know, you have to pay us to play these games, you know, just as, you know, funding it? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, the... Oh, it's, it's... It's a difficult situation because, like... I, I, I just don't know. Like, like esports... Like, uh, you know me in first-person shooters, like, like or, or third-person shooters, or 18th-person shooters, you know, I, I, they, they're, they're just not my kind of game kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But, like, even if they were, I, I, I couldn't be that committed to one game. Like, mm -hmm. I could not, like, even Seven Days to Die, I couldn't be that committed kind of thing. Like, I have almost 2,000 hours into that game, but that's, but you know, from, like, early 2000 or no that's from like 
early 2015. I mean, that's like 2,000 hours over 15 years kind of thing. That You do the math, and that's not going to be very much a day. Yeah. And again, like I do applaud the people who can make this work in terms of playing games at that level. Like My family constantly you know, tells me when they hear about Ninja or they hear about Big Tournament, why don't you do that? You play a lot of video games. And I'm like, yeah, I play like 15 to 20 games a week. I don't sit and play one game eight hours a day. Because then I would probably jump out the window next to me if I just had to play one game every, you know, play the same game every day, 12 hours a day. I mean, you already do that with Isaac, don't you? Oh, no. Even Isaac, I only do like a one run. Like, try playing that, you know, 12 hours of Isaac. Or yeah. 12 hours of auction not included in one sitting. I've done that before. <laughs> but, like, you, like, if you take that average, you know, take that time and average it out, it's like an hour a day that I've played seven days a die kind mm -hmm. of thing. Like, you know, it's definitely not 12 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. Every day kind of thing. And it's that same kind of mentality or that same kind of ethic you need if you want to become really good at speedrunning a game. Um, when I uh, uh, I spoke with a Grand Pooh Bear once, like in an email, and he said one of the advices he gives people is that pick a game that you don't mind playing, you know, all day, every day, because that's the only way you're going to learn a game at you know to get to that level. Mm -hmm. But uh, to bring this back to Evo, and then we'll move on to weird games that. Again, like, it's such a very weird position, because you know a lot of the competitors and a lot of the companies, they have no real stake with the leadership of EVO. You know, they deal with them simply as a contract or, you know, monetary agreement. But Yeah, all they care is that they make money. Exactly. But it's, again, something that we're seeing more and more, especially with kind of what's been happening with the game industry these past few weeks, that... A lot of nastiness is coming to the surface, and suddenly you need to decide, do you want your name to be attached to that? Yeah. And I don't think this is going to go away in the next few days. There is something I just thought of, though. Like, wait, I mean, my current game, Project Triad, could potentially evolve into an eSport, and I have been doing a minimum amount of research into that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I'm, that's not my goal or anything, but I'm not going to be like, no, you can't have it as an eSport kind of thing. I'm not going to to restrict <laughs> people or anything like that, but I, I am, you know, trying to, you know, at least do this basic, you know, kind of thing, and, you know, you know, I, I wouldn't mind having an eSport for it. It's just that I would, you know, like, I wouldn't, you know, care you know, other people created these ports, but I would, you know, mm -hmm. probably want an official one for, you know, the game. And then if anybody wanted to create sub ones, that would be fine too. Not one of those, you know, uh, what was it, Blizzard that, when did Blizzard that, that, uh, that shut down all the esports so they could open up their particular one? Could have been. I can't remember who did it. It was probably Blizzard, but I don't remember. Like, you know, I wouldn't shut anybody else down. I would, try to, you know, make the best one that I could do and hopefully it was better than theirs. You know, because, like, if the official one isn't better than the unofficial ones, then you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. And, of course, if that happens, maybe the other ones might die out, maybe they won't die out. Who knows? <laughs> but, it's an interesting kind of thought. Not something I'm aiming for or anything, though. All right, but I think with that, let's get to our weird game segment, and then we'll talk about characterization when it comes to video games. So let's see what oddities, or could be potentially good games, coming out in the next week or so. There we go. And something uh, I discovered recently that I uh, that I theorized was already a thing, but didn't didn't actually know for a hundred percent. But 
itch games do end up getting on to to uh, to Key Miller. Mm -hmm. So it's not just Steam games, it's also itch games. Hmm. This one looks alright. Challenging a platformer. Yeah, the aesthetics aren't top notch though. For yeah. sure. I'm I'm you know, because of that I'm predicting a failure. Mm. But it might be a legitimately good game. <laughs> Kinda like a uh other shark game, uh mm -hmm. I forget the name of it. Uh Vision Soft Reset. Yeah. Vision Soft Reset. I think the aesthetics are probably better than Vision Soft Reset though. Mm-hmm. But okay. not by a huge portion. Alright, this one I have no idea what's going on. It looks Use like a tactical RPG from the Create a path to send the appropriate can to the cute bat monster. Okay. That is weird. Based on esoteric languages, befunge and tray funges. Are those actual things? I have no idea what the heck that is. 42 I unique levels, 7 hand-drawn biomes. That's a red flag right there. I don't know what this game is about. This looks like a... <coughs> this looks like a uh, Zack-like to me. That you're not really playing the game. You're trying to solve a puzzle. I have no idea. Well, you need to do A and B. <laughs> NC, ND, and E. If you just if if you go if you go if you go with great aesthetics, there's many games out there that have amazing aesthetics with not good gameplay and they succeed wildly. Um mm -hmm. uh there's one particular studio that does that all the time and uh <laughs> uh what what was their what was their studio name? Lazy Bear? Yeah, Lazy Bear. Lazy Bear. Lazy Bear does that. They succeed wildly. They have amazing pixel art in their games and they their games really lack and really grindy kind of thing. Mm. They did have one really good hit, you know, kind of thing that was at the beginning the uh Punch Club and I played that and I did like it. It was too grindy, but it was not bad kind of thing. The other games I've made are way more grindy and 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 very, very lacking in the goodness. Mm -hmm. So here we have a game designed as a classic roguelike. We have top-down, procedural generation. I think I'm going to put in for this because I can kind of look at one of these older or more classic design ones, or a true roguelike, as some people have said. Yep, nope. but as they've also said, as we've said, they don't. We don't care if you make your your game look bad on purpose. I am very much afraid to click on this one. I like that chair simulator. Yeah, that chair simulator is mm, that's gold. You need to get a key for that. Uh huh. Let me click on that one. Yeah, do it. <laughs> Mouse stream. What? So it's an endless jumper? Well, a lot, uh, to Worm's qu thing, comment, a lot don't get it. That's because a lot don't get, you know, really amazing aesthetics. <laughs> Meet girls, okay. I don't oh, that's think there's very specific. I don't think there's a whole lot of games out there with really good aesthetics that failed. Hmm. There's there's games out there with really good aesthetics that did not break even, what commercially failed, but they didn't fail hard kind of thing. But there's many many games that look all right, decent or you know goodish kind of thing. That that uh, 
played amazingly and we were like, you know, some of the best games ever made that fell horribly. Like Visions of Reset. Mm-hmm. And Cormajor, my last game. So the idle game Soda Dungeon is getting another getting a sequel now. Uh, not it was a decent idle game, but I was downloading the uh, version of this for mobile, and it is very annoying to play with ads. So they mm-hmm. cut that out for the PC. I mean, could it be something interesting. I just don't know how well the idle market does on PC these days. I don't know, but I know a couple people that are really, really into it. What is this? So, like I don't the know exactly what that means. Like the pixel art. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty good pixel art. Don't like the character so much. Like the enemies seem more defined than the main character. Yeah. All right, I'll put in for it. Uh, let's see. What's I'm choosing? Deer Hunter Extreme. Banana. Extreme. Banana Man. But the title is Banana Hell. I don't know. Should I click on this? It's Banana Hell Man. Not Hellboy, but Hellman. Banana Hellman. Yes, you should click on it. Oh, I was not expecting that. Platforming jumping challenge game. That's, uh... But they don't know what a platformer is. Jumping your way up. It is very hard. Yeah. Wait. It's only five levels? Yeah, it's... With 300 yeah. lines of speech. Mm, that's a lot of red flags. Mm. Let's see. We'll do two more and then we will move on. Brain Boom. Electro Ride. Wait, I think we've seen this game. So it's about neon racing. Cyberpunk. Hmm. Oh, Sex Cruise VR. Let's click on that one. I'm sure there'll there'll be nothing but good stuff there. Yep. Wait. Furry love. <laughs> Wait, they're making another Curse of the Moon too. I think the Curse of the Moon uh, version of Bloodstain was better than the uh, main game. Hmm. Huh? I'm going to put in for it. I doubt I'm going to get it, though, because I don't think I got the uh, press key for the first one. Dr. Milo's Revenge. This Viseratum? <laughs> What's Choco Pixel? Uh, let's see. Back it up. Minimalist Colorful Puzzle Game. Get the toy car to the finish. Is it my imagination? I don't see a toy car. Yeah, I'm not seeing one either. Okay, good. I thought I was just losing my vision there. And maybe you need a soft reset. Mm. What? Okay. Rock, paper, shift. Uh uh-uh, somebody's making a rock, paper, scissors game. Uh, I'm going to have to sue them. Turn based puzzle game with mind bending grid. Strategy. Three chapters of puzzles. Rock, paper, and scissors. I thought you have to pay extra for the scissors. Hmm. Looks like somebody's been playing a lot of Chromasia. Hmm. Hmm. Looks a little interesting. Vagris. The Ribbon Rooms? I think some one of my friends was talking about this one. Role-playing game, heavy focus on exploration, branching narrative. Hmm. 
looks like very stilted animations for combat. Mm -hmm. It might be that way on purpose, though, so yeah. for style. Those are some names right there. Some real names right there. <laughs> Alright, well, I'll put in for it. We'll see more people trying to copy uh, Darkest Dungeon. Alright, and... Void Space. Why does that sound familiar? Mini oh, Army yeah. Tactics Medieval. Mini Army... Well, that's a mouthful. Casual turn-based strategy. Hmm. I thought it was going to look better than that from the screenshot. <laughs> Thumbnail. Our secret below. Delivery simulator. Ace of Space. Drill through. Clear four planets. Take on three bosses. Not to be confused with Space Ace. Or Ace of Base. Yeah. All right. Eh. Well, at least a few decent ones. Yeah. What about Sheep Island? Sheep Island. Oh, and I just seen Pet Girl. <laughs> Where's Draken? I don't know. <laughs> he better be here, though. Sheep pet girl. breeding game. Use your hands, spend your points. Okay. Alright, you're just making a sheep. Making a whole lot of sheep. It's insane. Uh, could be confused with another word. Oh, Rocky Town. And Rocky's got his own game now? Yeah. He's in his own town? Oh, good. Another horror game where you can't really see what's in these screenshots. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a Rocky game. It says Edge of Insanity. That's not. No, that's Rocky another something. one. Here's a Rocky Town. Oh, it's in VR. Oh, wait. Uh, rock. I don't see any rocks. Or rock people. No, or Rocky. Mm mm. It's a lie. <laughs> the thing about, like, these horror games when they try to promote them, I've noticed this pattern. They'll have, like,. Four or five thumbnails that are like very hard to see, and then one that is like completely crystal clear. Mm -hmm. Can't you just make all your uh, thumbnails crystal clear? You know what they should do is they should put four screenshots of just blackness, just black. Somebody did that though. And then and then one screenshot of just white. Oh, good. <laughs> She killed Bailey. I think I made that out. <laughs> and you could call it black and white horror. There we go. All That's right. That's the game. Somebody make it. Dungeons and guns. Did we and see? give me fifty percent because it was my idea, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. Sometimes it's very hard to find some of these games. Or was it? I think he was commenting on another game yeah, that we've is. seen that had dungeons and guns. Ew. Oh. Never mind, it was literally dungeons and guns. Well, it's an early access, 14 kinds of enemies, one biome. Ooh, it has a light system. Ooh. Mm. Yeah, that looks like a train wreck and a half. Somebody really wants to make Enter the Gungeon. But worse. <laughs> Way worse. Look at that UI. Yeah. Yeah. Alright, so let's get to our main topic. And let us talk about characterization when it comes to video games. So, one of the major things about world building and trying to establish a greater sense of place these days is making sure that the characters and, you know, the people that are going to inhabit these places are kind of consistent to it. So, this is the topic Shark Brob, so I'm going to ask you, why does characterization matter as a developer now? Well, characterization is a kind of wi wide-ranging topic. I mean, because, like, 
it doesn't just apply to characters as as you would think because it also applies to the world you know kind of thing you remember how before we at the last round table we were talking about how the you know the world and the story and all this stuff needs to fit together that in turn is characterization you know like the characterization of the world because the world is a character in your game do not do not fool yourself into thinking that the world is not a character because the world is absolutely a character in your game as is your character because the world will have a life of its own just like your characters will and if the world is flat or your characters are flat you've already you felt horribly at characterization if if it is you know, like, like when you were playing that uh, anime Dark Souls game, I forget the name of it. Um, you know, you were you know like constantly talking through there about my generic you know uh, you know anime character over here that has no input in the story because they completely killed all characterization from your character for that personalization. Mm-hmm. And you don't you don't have to kill all characterization to get personalization. Personalization makes it a lot harder to characterize for sure because you don't want to make you don't want to characterize your character as as uh, like this really nice guy kind of thing that you know is you know all about you know is really naive and you know you know boy charm kind of thing and mm-hmm. boys charm. And then, and then give options in there for character com- composite, you know, character customization to make him look like a pirate or an emo or anything, mm-hmm. <laughs> or like some kind of like football player or something. Like you, 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 you wouldn't want to do that kind of thing. That would be bad. You know, I mean, like there's, there's, is ways around it. Like you can, um, you can. Uh, limit the amount of you know, uh, uh, customization kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I know like uh, a lot of RPGs uh, like uh, uh, Tales of Azuria I guess I said that right. Um, what they did was the character outfits and everything they're, they're, they're solid kind of thing there's a few different outfits they get over time kind of thing like there was you know like the main character she was originally in a dungeon so there was the you know ripped up dungeon outfit that she wore you know the prison outfit basically although it wasn't a normal prison so it was a very different kind of outfit you know it was more rags than anything and then there was her you know her normal outfit and I think she got two others across time and you can swap between them at a, after you get to a certain point, as well as they give you two or three swats where you could add customization, like, uh, and you can put anything you wanted in these swats, you know, like you could put a hat in one swat. You could put like a little pin on another. You could put a little rose and tuck that into your, you know, um, pocket kind of thing. You could uh, like, do all these little things. It was just a little bit of co- customization. You could put little wings, little, you know, fabric wings on the back. You could put a little fake halo above their head, you know, and you could do any kind of combination in between their list of, I don't know, probably 50, maybe 50 cosmetics between the entire game, probably. And in those, you got to pick, I think it was either two or three that you could equip at the same time. And I think important thing to clarify, when you say customization, I think you're referring to personalization. Customization yeah. is game affecting elements, while right. personalization is aesthetics, uh, costumes, things that don't directly change how the game is played. And yet, Correct. like, personalization options go hand in hand and to some extent with characterization, especially when you're allowed to dress up or change. Uh, in-game characters, not player-created ones. And yeah. The the issue is is you have to limit it to outfits and and accessories that could possibly fit the characterization they have made for that character kind of thing. 
or you go the route of, you know, some of the Japanese developers, they'll just release, like, tons and tons of like, various personalization options that make, like, no sense. Dressed as Horror and Warrior up in a cat costume. Give them a, a rainbow fro <laughs> and all that <laughs> other crazy stuff. Yeah, there, there are a few of those. <laughs> but, but some of those actually make sense because, like, they, they you know, there are some of those Japanese games that do give you those options, but they give you the crazy cat costume because that character is actually really crazy about cats, so it fits their characterization. <laughs> but there are some that give you that crazy cat costume, and they have there's never anything about cats in the entire game, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Or that they'll would be bring like pop cultural right references, or they'll do like a cross promotion. You know, dress your yeah. character up as Goku. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, what wasn't there something like that in Smash Brothers? Oh yes, or, they did a Sans from Undertale, a Mega Man. You can dress your Me Avatar up in that. Mm-hmm. And again, like it's this is one of those topics where, like, for some games, this doesn't matter at all. Like, if we're talking about a game that there's very little in terms of world building and lore, if it's just said with an excuse for, watch these very detailed characters beat the you-know-what out of them, then, you know, you can do whatever you want in terms of your personalization. Mm -hmm. But when you're trying to build a game that is built around a consistent world tone or world lore, then you have to be a little bit more attentive in terms of your character designs. You know, something like um, like with Dark Souls. And when you have full ca- uh, customization kind of thing, that usually just throws customiz- uh, characterization right out the window. Like with your anime Dark Souls game. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, all characterization of your main character was gone. You still had characterization of the other characters kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But not not of your main character, in like they, you know, I I kept on I remember you keep on saying you know occasionally they actually included me. Thanks for my input. You know mm-hmm. they're like you're all right with this and you nod. You know kind of thing and that that's it. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> or you shake somebody's hand and that that's it. You know it's like it's your uh, own input in, in this world. Yeah, it's like you're not even the main character. You're the you know. The silent, you know, third wheel or something in the conversation kind of thing. Who still has to do everything. It's just not yeah. in cutscene. Yeah. And it's definitely one of those things, again, that you don't really... I think a lot of people don't necessarily notice it if it's not, you know, in your face. But it's kind of one of those factors that does help to elevate a game when it's done right. Yeah. And, you know, I'm definitely working on characterization in my current game, Project Triad. Um, So, one of the key things that I'm trying to get out of my, you know, world and everything, out of my entire game, is I'm trying to theme it that it is a... the, The first set, anyway, is a U.S. city many, many years in the future. I don't know how many years probably 500 plus, you know, deep into the future kind of thing. And uh, not like 20 years into the future, like, 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 you know, the year 2000 when the world ends and we have flying cars kind of thing. No, this is like 500 plus years in the future kind of thing. And um, maybe even a thousand, but maybe even farther than that. But I wanted to make something that was representative of a U.S. city in this first set because this first set is supposed to be in a U.S. city. So it makes sense that I make a U.S., you know, try to, you know, fit to a U.S. city. So what that means is, is that, you know, U.S. cities have generally a diversity, you know, they're not all white people, they're not all black people, they're not all Asian people, they're, they're a mix kind of thing. And I'm trying to get a believable mix, not necessarily an accurate mix, of what you would 
think you would see in that kind of city kind of thing. And, you know, so I'm trying to get that kind of mix of characters in there. And then every character will have characterization. And characterization for each character will, you know, at least somewhat depend on their race. Because, uh, you know, not, not every black person acts the same, but, you know, there are commonalities yeah. between a lot of them, but not all of them. You know, same thing with white people, same thing with Asian, you know, like, like you know, some people, you know, some races say certain words funny in English, you know, generally, but not always, you know, there's, there's many different aspects to it, to where, you know, it's just trying to put together something cohesive and fitting to my world in the way I'm making it kind of thing to feel like a a US city. And it doesn't matter that it's actually, you know, statistically a you know fitting of the US city kind of thing because every city in the US is very, very different. Um, I, I looked it up on statistics yesterday and you know found out that, you know, you know, it kind of surprised me, but like when you look at the the uh, like whole U.S., I think that only like eighteen percent of people are black in the U.S. And it's like, you know, I think there's a lot higher than eighteen percent where I live at. But you know, every you know, and he also said that like like I think it was something like ten percent are Asian. It's like. I think there's pretty close to zero percent of Asian where I live at. So like, we have, you know, of course I'm not too far from Memphis, kind of thing. So like, you know, every every place would have kind of a different thing. And I'm not going for exact or for you know modeling it after a specific city or anything. I'm just trying to get an overall feel of, hey, this is a city in the U.S. kind of thing. Because everybody has different experiences in their U.S. city kind of thing. Like, like mine would be more, you know, probably black heavy and more uh, Asian, you know, Latin kind of thing. Where another city may be very, very Asian heavy, very white lacking and, you know, medium black kind of thing. Like, like there, there's all kinds of different cities. But, like, I'm just trying to get a general feel and so that it characterizes the world in such a way that, hey, I think this is in the U.S. kind of thing. Like, like I don't even have to tell them that it's in the U.S. They get that it's in the U.S. because they see these characters. And not only that, but, like, you know, people in the U.S. behave differently than people in the U.K., even though we're, we're all English speakers, you know, like, like, I mean, there's a stereotype in, 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 in UK that everybody drinks tea, you know, three times a day. And, you know, maybe we'll have a UK character in there that will drink three, tea three times a day. But, you know, maybe we'll have a UK character in there that won't drink tea at all or hate tea or something. You know, there, there, there's no, you know, everybody's different kind of thing. And, but the feeling is something that you really have to go for kind of thing. You want to have your world characterized and your characters characterized in such a way that it feels like a cohesive world, that mm -hmm. what you're going for is what it feels like without even you telling anybody what it is. Because bad characterization would be that, you know, hey, here's this world and you, you know, there's, you know, these people in there and everything. They're like, okay, so this is a generic city or whatever. Mm. No, this is, you know, Africa. It's like, where's all the black people then? You know? It's, or, hey, this is Asia. Where's all the Asians? You know? you know. And you have to be really careful when you base your game on quote-unquote real world or trying to take place, you know, on a Earth or something like that in terms of how you characterize the places. Mm-hmm. And, it, you know, that's, you know, there's liberties that we're allowed to take because we're far, far in the future. And that's kind of what I'm depending on kind of thing for that because we don't have to follow everything in the real world. We don't have to hardly follow anything in the real world because we're 500 plus years in the future. I mean, 
pretty much everything we have now <laughs> is probably not going to exist in 500 years. Mm -hmm. You know, probably every house that's on this planet right now, with an exception of like a few that have been, you know, saved for, for historic <laughs> sake kind of thing, they ain't going to be there anymore. They're going to be bulldo bulldozed oh, nice. down. They're going to be gone, you know, and <laughs> something else will be in its place. You know, where there used to be a city, there may just be a pothole from where somebody set off a nuke, you know, 200 years from now. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and again, like, as a developer, especially if you're writing the story yourself, you are given, you know, free reign to do what you want in terms of how you see this world develop. The important mm -hmm. skill, of course, is being able to convey that to the consumer, to the people playing it. That it's not just, oh, I just ripped off Game of Thrones by their robots or their uh, bunny rabbits instead of humans. Yeah, that's... You never want to rip off somebody else's story or somebody else's game design or anything mm -hmm. else. You want to take inspiration <laughs> from many sources kind of thing, but you... And I would never take inspiration solely from one source, kind of thing. Like that's 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 generally bad, kind of thing. Like you know, like with our current one, I mean, our original inspiration was a uh, triple triad, hence the name, temporary name of Project Triad. Um, triple triad, which was a mini game in Final Fantasy VIII, and then later I took inspiration from Magic: The Gathering, Hearthstone, mainly just with their mana system because there's not much good in Hearthstone <laughs> kind of thing um, you know and several other card games and I, I did research into all these different card games and you know figure it out kind of what made them tick and not only that but I just didn't be like oh this thing made this one you know I really like this feature from this one why don't I just put this in my game no I didn't do that it was you know I played all these games and and when I was researching them you know, they, they, a lot of their mechanics, you know, pretty much any of their mechanics did not translate into mine because, you know, very, very different gameplay loops kind of thing. But things gave me ideas for something around that kind of thing, but very, very different that fits my game kind of thing. And again, and, it's all about making something that comes from you. That's mm -hmm. not just you repeating what somebody else has done, but saying, this is how I'm putting my own unique spin on it. I mean, as a really good example of that, you could look at the whole of YA genre, with everybody, you know, being inspired from everything, from vampires to Greek gods to, you know, fantasy references, medieval references. You name the reference, and there's probably a YA take of it somewhere out there. Yeah, and to clarify what I said there to Pony and Elrude is, what I mean is, is Hearthstone has a very pay-to-win kind of thing, very misbalanced, very unbalanced, and you you can get a three-cost unit that has three attack, or you know that's a common, or you can get a three-cost five attack card that's an extra rare kind of thing. And there's very lacking of balance, and then they've shifted all the balance to pay to win kind of thing. And then they've done the loot box in the card packs. They haven't done legitimate card packs. They've done loot boxes where you get a guaranteed uncommon that they named a rare, and then you get, you know, four random cards that are, you know, each loot box and everything. And the core gameplay loop is just, I have a attack stat and I think a defense stat, if I remember right, and let's go kind of thing. Just, you know, simple, you know, is this number higher than this? You know, kind of thing. And it, it's, there's not much to it. The main thing that I think that makes Hearthstone good in any kind of way is their energy system slash mana system, whatever they call it, um, to where you don't have to worry about drawing your your energy or playing your you know doing any of that kind of thing your energy just comes to you every turn automatically and you can't ever get mana screwed like you do in magic the gathering and many other card games you get screwed because you can't play cards because you don't have that key element and hearthstone automatically gives it to you kind of thing 
And that's that I think was a great aspect of Hearthstone. Everything else is mostly pay to win and very basic mechanics. So that's that's the reason why I kind of said that. Like Matt said, pay to win. Yeah, Hearthstone which is exactly game for me. what I'm trying to avoid in my current game. But again, presentation really does matter, and that is one thing where Blizzard has excelled on for the longest time. I mean, the fact that it was one of the first mobile games to go, or first uh, uh, CCGs to really become popular on mobile as well was a huge thing. I've spoken to a few developers about that, and having that in your hand really helped elevate it. And it was one of those things that it took went a longer than it should have to make that leap. Yeah. I know Magic the Gathering made many card games that were very, very limited. They were less card games and more... I mean, the, the gameplay was still kind of the same, but they were they were limited because they were just, you know, one-time purchase kind of thing. They weren't mm -hmm. so much the traditional they card game kind of thing. And then, and then it would just have, like, one set... And you would only play against AI kind of thing. It was like, oh, wasn't very good. But then they went to the Magic the Gathering Arena they got now, and that that is doing, I think, very, very well. And it's very much like the core Magic the Gathering kind of experience kind of thing. But and uh, to, PC. to Worm's point, unfortunately, it shouldn't be greater, but... As we've said before, so much about that first look matters to the consumer base. That it doesn't matter if your game's core gameplay, you know, falters after like an hour of playing. If it has an impressive hook, it may be enough to get people to play or to at least buy it. And one of the like shocking things I see from a lot of the games I've been looking at on the Steam sales is that they'll have very impressive numbers of people who bought them. And then less than half of those people who bought it play beyond the first 20 minutes of playing it. Or the first 20 minutes of content. Yeah. And to Matt's point, yeah, you know, art is very expensive in every game, honestly. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, like, art is very expensive in CCGs. I, I can verify. I got a really good deal on my art that looks quite amazing, I think. Of course, I'm doing some of the art. I'm doing the UI and stuff. But, like, you know, I paid somebody to do my character art, and yeah, I mean, like, it's expensive, even though I've gotten an amazing, amazing deal kind of thing. It is still very expensive on that amazing, amazing deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, bringing this back to, like, characterization and designing, like, Hearthstone would be another solid example of that, because of, obviously, for the fact that it was built off of World of Warcraft. And World mm -hmm. Warcraft is another game that, of course, Blizzard has certainly copied elements and things from other genres and places. And they do just enough tweaking to make it their own. Yeah, and they really characterize their characters. Blizzard, Blizzard is really good at characterization mm -hmm. in pretty much everything but Diablo. Yeah. Well, you don't like yeah. the story of Deckard Cain? <laughs> <laughs> I do, but like, there's not a whole lot of characterization. Like, like mm -hmm. Diablo is almost like a black sheep in in the the uh, the Blizzard lineup kind of thing because it's the one game that I know of that they make that doesn't have extremely strong characterization. I mean, like uh, with Overwatch, I mean they they just make video after video that is just building on this outside lore and characterization mm -hmm. kind of thing. And it's important to clarify that, like, when we talk about characterization along these lines, we're talking about defining these characters beyond just, that's the uh, redhead who uses a sniper rifle. That's mm -hmm. the big strong guy who has a sword. It's about building a lore, and as we said, it's about world building, but with your characters themselves. And as Shark said, Blizzard is one of the strongest studios and they're also one of the best examples of why this works so well that mm. when you have strong characterization it affords you this ability to you know branch out again the a lot of people love 
<laughs> All right, John. Yeah. It, it's one of those reasons uh, why people love the trailers and the uh, cinematics that Blizzard puts out. That they create full-on personalities for their various characters. And it's one of those things that not only does it elevate a game's story, but it elevates the brand recognition as well. And brand recognition is can go many different ways. Again, Nintendo has some of the highest brand recognition ever made. And yeah, yeah. exactly, Elrude. I was just going to get to Team Fortress. Like, Team Fortress did just that as well. And characterization also, I think, in speaking about Team Fortress, goes hand in hand with the aesthetics of your game. Exactly. You... That's what I was about to get to. Because, like, mm -hmm. when you're doing your characterization, your your aesthetics needs to match your characterization. Mm -hmm. Everything needs to mesh to, well together, like like gears, cogs in a machine, as they say, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And you want, like, you don't want to have a you know image, let's say, of my game, of a you know girl with a giant sniper rifle and a cowboy outfit to to act like a street punk kind of thing. No, mm -hmm. she would not act like that kind of thing. She would, you know, she's obviously, you know, very much, uh, you know, akin to the old style westerns kind of thing, and she's, you know, mm -hmm. very much into that kind of thing. So she would probably take aspects from that into her characterization kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you know, that is one thing I'm going to be doing when I start writing up the profiles on each character, because I want to get the art finalized and get everything completely finalized before. I start going into writing the these you know profiles for each of these and then go into the scripts and everything of writing the scripts. But like everything needs to fit together. The the story meshes well with the character, you know, the character, you know, if you if you don't mesh well, <laughs> then you lose the characterization. Characterization requires meshing. Yeah. And when it sticks out you know, you can really kind of see like the rough edges, you know, rubbing up against each other. Yeah, if if you have, you know, something that doesn't mesh well in there, then your whole characterization is just going to fly right out the window <laughs> because you just the whole point the the real you know big advantage of characterization is it gets people into the world. They they forget that they're sitting at their computer playing a game, not mm -hmm. completely, but, you know, in the inner recesses of their mind, they forget that they're sitting at their PC, and they get deep into that world, and they're like, mm -hmm. I really love this character kind of thing, and, you know, I really want to see this character do this kind of thing, and they get really into it. And the once you, and then that one sliver where you break it, where you break, where your gears do not mesh, and they grind and everything. That immersion is break broken, and it's like a you know pane of glass shattering in your head, and you're like, oh crap. <laughs> you know, it's like it's like the Wizard of Oz when you all of a sudden realize there's a man behind the curtain, kind of thing. Like like it was fine as long as that red curtain stayed hot, hidden, <laughs> and nobody realized. But the second somebody realized that, oh, the magic was gone. And uh, to Matt's point, I'm afraid I think we're opposites on this one because I prefer uh, reading the text than hearing the characters talk because I'm a fast reader. But yeah, to uh, Worm's point about Mario and Song, I mean that's a very it's a very interesting example if we compare it to say someone like Abe from Abe's Odyssey or the Team Fortress characters that Mario and Sonic aren't really deep in terms of their characterizations. Like, we don't... There's not a lot of, you know, lore around those two characters. There's but, a good bit around Sonic. There's not much around Mario. Yeah. Sonic... Well, Sonic has the added benefit of, you know, the uh, animated series. The Grim Dark one was, of course, really good. Mm hmm But, like, with something like... We compare Mario to the Team Fortress characters... Like one part about characterization that I think definitely holds true is yeah, that's a good point there as well, Pony, that Sonic talks. Like there is a person 
<laughs> Let's it go. And don't forget the wah when he falls and dies. <laughs> That's the other one. <laughs> but yeah. uh, one of the important points about this is that the character needs to look like they have to look unique. There has to be a brand to their appearance. And this is again, I remember there was a talk, I don't know who did this, but they used um, like shadows, just like the uh, black and white image or just the black image of a character. You were talking about silhouette. Silhouette, thank you. Yeah, yeah. They, and, the silhouette needs to be identifiable as possible. Yeah. And that is something that, again, like Mario has in spades. Like you show someone the silhouette of Mario, you know, jumping, you know, with his hand up in the air, people are going to see that. As long as you don't show the pixel art version. Yeah. And, like, one of the things, like, why, like, Team Fortress is such a good example is, like, Team Fortress, like, outside in a blizzard, was really one of the first cases, at least first times for me, that I saw a developer go that extra mile in terms of defining uh, defining somebody or defining their characters beyond just, this is a warrior, he is angry, this is a wizard, he speaks intelligently. And, yeah, there were no characters. Mm -hmm. And, like, you saw this, like, first it started with, you know, the uh, lore of their updates. Then they went to the comics. Or, no, I'm sorry, lore updates. Then they really went all in with the Meet the Team videos. And then they went to the comics. So now it's not, you know, just, you know, this is the scout. He runs fast. You know, he is the tough guy from Brooklyn. The spy is the suave you know, always one step ahead. And, mm -hmm. again, like, this is, I think, one of those some very interesting, or one of the tough points to talk about with this. Good characterization doesn't, like, by itself, I don't think it sells a game, but when it's attached to a good game, or to, an, to a great game, it does elevate things so much. I mean, we could even see this with kind of Payday 2 or Payday's, you know, rocky history. I don't know. I, I think that characterization could sell a game. Because, I mean, good gameplay doesn't sell a game. It's aesthetics. And mm -hmm. characterization is definitely uh, an aspect that ties into aesthetics kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, if you have good characterization, you more than likely have good aesthetics. And if you have good aesthetics, you probably have thought about good lore and good world building. It's like one of those things that everything begins to like tie together. Yep. And, and characterization is really the, the kind of link that ties everything together. It's the, you know, like I said, the cogs in the machine kind of thing. So like, if you can get characterization right, then more than likely, you got most other things right. Because I have a know, question for it, you, it, unless you're just blind and realize that you thought you had characterization right because you wrote a story, mm -hmm. and then and then didn't really carry that through everything else. So here's my challenge. Here's my question for you, Shark. Then on that mm -hmm. point, would you consider Monster Train to have good characterization? Mm, not really. I mean, Monster Train has good aesthetics, but there's there's nothing that says anything about the characters that make them special. Like like there's like like they could easily make good characterization in there. Like they could be like, you know, this you know fish character. You know the 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 uh, the one for the water ones. Mm -hmm. The uh... oh no, I can't remember their name now. The, the mage or the magic faction. Yeah. Them, like, they could, you know, put some, you know, lore out, you know, they could, you know, character build in that and say, yes, that's, that's a, it. Stygian, oh, thank you. The Stygian guard. Like, they could easily go in there and be like, yeah, these people were fish people, you know, that were affected by some kind of uh, demon... Uh, you know, demon virus that infected everybody, and now this, you know, fish character here with this wand here, this wand spear, that's the king spear, and he is the king of all these people. And they could, you know, 
you know, say that he runs Atlantis and everything and all this other stuff, and they could, they could give him characterization. They could give all the characters characterization, but right now, no. Like, I mean, they have identifiable silhouettes and everything. They have, you wouldn't mistake them, but that's not characterization. That's more aesthetics and brand identity kind of thing. Now, the thing Which, about Monster Train, this is something that we talked about before with it, is that there is a ton of lore to everything in the game, but it's it's not uh, displayable unless you turn it on, or it's off by default. And, again, like, it's such a very weird point. It's, again, part of that kind of that line you have to walk as a game developer. Because, on one hand, you have people who want to play the game. You know, you want to load into this match, you want to star run, you know, fight enemies, get cards, etc., etc. But then you have, on this other hand, you're trying to build this world around it, and some people don't care about the lore. Again, like, for myself, I usually do care about lore and world building, but I don't care about the plot of your game, in that sense. Like, if I'm in the mood, if I'm playing... Yeah, exactly, Elrood. Great mess of hidden lore, Dark Souls, yeah. Like, mm. if I'm playing a game... I don't care about your characters having an emotionally driven cutscene. I, I just don't. I want to get to the next bit of gameplay. Like, very few example or very few exceptions, like maybe the Yakuza games have sometimes hooked me for their story. And you're going to have people like that. There are people who will gush over every new cinematic and cutscene in Overwatch. Just as you have people who are going to be like, I don't care at all. I just want to load up rank and, you know, get my next reward. Or I want to get to diamond or platinum, whatever is the next rating there. Yeah, and that's kind of the issue with multiplayer games versus single player games. Mm -hmm. Because with multiplayer games, it is so much harder to put story and such mm -hmm. into the game. And good character, you know, good characterization can't really truly come about without good story kind of thing. I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to have a lot of story, but it has to have good story for what's there. And when you're talking about a multiplayer game kind of thing, mm -hmm. any story at most points is going to completely drag down the game. Nobody wants mm -hmm. to start looking for a multiplayer match and then find one, and then it's like, here, watch this 10-minute cutscene before your game starts. Yeah. And Nobody's this is, going to want that. And this but is one of the issues. Of, go ahead, finish your thought. There, there is one thing they would not would like, though, and that's what I'm doing in my current game, is rather than that kind of thing that I just said, why not, while they're matchmaking, you know, you have a predictive timer that estimates how long they're going to wait, like 45 seconds kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then you play a short, like thirty second cutscene, and then the cutscene ends, and then you still got five seconds, fifteen seconds, to to before you find a match, and then you go into your match, kind of thing. You were just sitting there staring endlessly mm -hmm. at a loading icon, doing nothing, kind of thing. You had entertainment, and you were engaged during that thirty seconds of that forty five seconds, and then you only had to wait unengaged for the the last fifteen seconds. But that, I think that would be good because that's the 15 seconds to gain its, uh, uh, anticipation for the match kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, there's there's good ways and bad ways to to, to do it kind of thing. Yeah, you definitely don't want to put a cutscene in the middle of a multiplayer match. That, that's, a, that's a huge red flag right there. And... It is very, very hard to put any kind of story or any kind of thing like that in a multiplayer game, which means that it's very, very hard to put characterization in a multiplayer game, which is the reason why Overwatch has basically no characterization in their game, and most of the characterization is on their YouTube channel and whatnot. Yeah. You know, and again, it's and that, it's a weird economy for this topic that so much of, like, the people who care about the story of Overwatch, none of that matters to playing Overwatch. You know, they may put a little bit of, like, like kind of like the single player or, like, the uh, 
co-op mode, I think, that they're playing, or they put in Overwatch, and there's going to be an Overwatch 2. But mm -hmm. when you're loading up your umpteenth uh, ranked match, do you really care what Widowmaker's uh, life story is? Do you care what is happening there? And the example that I wanted to bring up was uh, Payday. And Payday ran into some very interesting or very interesting challenges with their lore and characterizations. That when it started, they tried to build this whole, you know, crime saga and mystery around the various heisters. And then as the game went on, they tried to introduce more characters, they tried to do more, they tried to build this engaging story, and a lot of people didn't care about it. And then eventually it was just all dropped for, you know, complete nonsensical, you know, craziness. Like, there was the uh, tie-in with Hardcore Henry, where they introduced, you know, the whole psychic battles. They had the Hotline Miami tie-in. Um, they uh, had a YouTuber tie-in, I think, with a big-name YouTuber brand. And the whole characterization kind of just fell by the wayside. Yeah. And your point with uh, Overwatch and uh, caring about, you know, uh, Black Widow or whoever you said mm -hmm. in there. The thing is, is you would care about it if they had done characterization, good characterization in the game, not just outside the game. You know, mm -hmm. the fact that they didn't put much characterization in the game, and it's very hard to be a multiplayer, but the fact that they didn't is the reason why you don't care about it while you're playing the game because you would only care about that if you went to Twitter or YouTube channel for that game and then got in there mm -hmm. and then even then you would care very little about that while you're playing the game but if it was in the game in such a way that it did not drag down the gameplay design of the game by having like a front you know like a you know big cutscene in the middle of a you know, multiplayer fight or you know <laughs> you know you know any kind of thing like that you don't want to mess up your design by by characterization by including mm -hmm. characterization do not do that because you're messing up your design you've got to design it around such a way that you can get this characterization in there and make it proper and that that really starts from the very early days mm -hmm. of your game development like don't like that is not something that can be tapped in at the end kind of thing. Yeah. It's you know, why the story for a lot of these games that do work, they're written you know, concurrently or at the same time as you're designing the game. And you can really tell when somebody saves the story for the last minute. Mm-hmm. And like, uh, one final point that I think we'll begin to wrap things up, or at least that's going to be it for me, is like going back to something like Dark Souls, for instance. Dark Souls, as we said, they are the king of lore and kind of that kind of world building behind the scenes. But they do suffer, I think, to some extent from a lack of decent characterizations. Like, mm -hmm. their characters are unique. Again, you see something like the unnamed king or Gundir, and, you know, they're immediately striking and they're unique in those aspects. But because so much of that lore is behind the scenes, it's still not really know. mattering to the story. Mm hmm Or there's there's not much there's not a story. Because like I I, I will, you know, repeat this, I've said this before, but lore isn't story, in my opinion. And the the way I see things is while lore isn't story, that doesn't mean lore isn't valuable to the story. Lore, mm -hmm. lore is an assistant to the story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like it's you think about a big business. You know, you've got the owner kind of thing that knows everything, exactly what's going to happen, and can instruct you in any kind of way. And then you have the secretary, the assistant, mm -hmm. that <laughs> helps him and knows a lot of things because she's dealt with a lot of things over time, kind of thing. But she doesn't know it all. She just has hints and tricks of you know aspects of it, but not the the whole thing. You know, it's like it's like it's like Coke or Diet Coke kind of thing. Like the secretary is a Diet Coke, and the you know 
the the you know owner is a coke kind of thing and lore lore is a diet coke of story kind of thing it's mm -hmm. not or the assistant of story you know it, it's not it's not story it's the assistant of the story and lore can add so much to a game kind of thing but i think that if you don't have enough if you don't have story in there to begin with Nobody, very little people, not nobody, but very little people are going to dig into what the lore is because, you know, story is the onboarding for lore kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like, and like, like nobody, you know, like, you know, like if, if you don't have basically the tutorial, something that gets you into it, you know, like initial story kind of thing, you know, that's right there in your face. Why would you even look up the stuff that is behind the scenes? Why would you go through that extra effort kind of thing if you weren't already invested in the story at that point? And that's the reason why a lot of people don't even look at the lore of Dark Souls kind of thing. And especially since you've got to put so much effort in to go collect all of these items to get these lores and dig it up. And then even after all that, you put them all together and and it doesn't make a lot of sense you know it takes like youtuber analysis videos to go <laughs> watch them to be like oh this is what they might meant kind of thing and at that point you know your story is that youtube video it's not your game it's not in your game there's no story in your game you just have lore that a youtuber has pieced together into a story kind of thing and you know that doesn't mean lore is bad or devalues lore it just means that lore isn't story you know just like you know like art is not story mm -hmm. art can definitely assist the story you know because like if you have good characterization and you're you're you can tell part of your story through the outfits and art of the characters kind of thing like if mm -hmm. if your characters are wearing wild west outfits kind of thing then that is assisting the story in telling you that you're in a Wild West environment or you're in some kind of simulation of the Wild West or, you know, you know you're in Westworld or something kind of thing because the characterization is assisting the story. But you, yeah, and, I, and to, like, build off of that, I was going to say something similar, that the, the world, the lore building, the characterization, that... You know, that is kind of the wrapper that assists the actual plot of your game. Like, mm -hmm. to Highlander's point about Dark Souls, Dark Souls has a story. You are the undead. You are... Oh, why do I always forget the name of it? The uh, the mark, you have the brand, or whatever, and you're cursed. That And you're trying to ring the spell. You're trying to save this world. That is the plot. That is your... The dark side. Thank you. That is hollow. Yeah, that's what I was thinking of. That is your story. That is what you are doing. Everything about how, you know, Anno Lundo came to be, what happened to Seth, Seth, whatever, whatever his name was, that is the world building. That has happened. That you as the player have no responsibility or any impact on. Yeah, that but part, the, thing is, the thing is about that quote-unquote story that what one paragraph or something mm -hmm. at the very beginning that's like the you know quote unquote story in a lot of games where you know hey you're you're a you know your your girlfriend was kidnapped and you got to go save her you know mm -hmm. give you two questions two guess on what that game is mm -hmm. the president's double been dragon. kidnapped by ninjas yeah yeah double dragon you know and <laughs> it's like you know like there's so many you know games that just like give you this one or two lines or you know paragraph or two paragraphs right at the beginning and it's not real story kind of thing it's just a here's the situation here's the summary. you don't have fun yeah you know? like hollow knight i would say has a better story than dark souls as more is happening with your character in hollow knight than what happens with your character in dark souls and the dark souls like they've said like their stories tend to end very ambiguously because you're never really going to see that character again or that interpretation. You can, because you're dealing with a player created character in a Souls like or in the Dark Souls game specifically, your your quote unquote character 
doesn't really become part of that world. You know, you may move things along. You know, you move that needle, you start the next age. But then everything else that happens, you're not really part of. You're not responsible for it. And then that is becomes the setup or the backdrop for Dark Souls 2 and Dark Souls 3. Yeah, which is the reason why, like, when you have complete character customization and everything, characterization tends to lag behind mm -hmm. because... The more customization it seems like your characters have, the less characterization they have. Because, you mean personalization again? Or? Yeah, per yeah, personalization. The more personalization you have, generally the less characterization you have of that yeah. character kind of thing. And usually that falls out into the world unless you end up in a scenario like the anime Dark Souls where they just ignore your main character except for the occasional handshake and everything. Oh yes, that was fun. And but uh, like... You you lose the you generally lose the characterization. There there is a way around it. Like I was saying earlier at the beginning, kind of thing. Like one way you can do it. And there's many different ways you can do it, but one way you could do it is you can have it to where they you don't have full customization. You have limited or full personalization. You have limited mm -hmm. personalization, kind of thing, and you can give them multiple characters to choose from like you can choose from these eight characters these five males and these five females kind of thing and then you can customize them you know, personalize them to a limited stance kind of thing and you know it tells you down at the bottom what their personality is going to be like kind of thing mm -hmm. and what these kind of characters are about kind of thing and then you go into the world like that and there's you don't have to make a you know the problem with it is that when you when you do per, uh, personalization you're making a character that fits whatever you want them to fit kind of thing when you're doing characterization you're making everything fit each other including the character so you really have to struggle with that kind of thing and you know there there's there's another way like where you can give them almost unlimited character customization kind of thing but in that character customization you give them like set personalities kind of thing like you 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 tell them that you want to be the bad boy kind of thing that, you know, or the badass or the, you know, the pop star or, you know, this role or that role. You select a role slash personality kind of thing. And then you build your character appearance based on that kind of thing. And then you can get potentially get good characterization with full customization. But that's up to the player. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I want to... Uh go to Matt's question and this will I think be the final point and he was asking about uh, can should puzzle games have characterization and uh, Miss Over brought up of course Miss and I think and I do think I agree with Elwood on this that again like characterization and that kind of branding can add to these games when it's done right. It's one of the reasons why so many games will license IPs to use for their games. You know, Marvel, DC, Final Fantasy, you name it. Because when you can attach something recognizable, something that, you know, can add to these games, it can do more to bring in people and it gives that game that added sense. Oh yeah, Sherlock Holmes. They it brings in that sense of branding to it. Again, it's one of those things that we've said before. Why should somebody play a generic puzzle game or a generic MOBA when they can play, you know, the officially licensed, you know, Marvel Avengers puzzle game or you know, a MOBA featuring I don't know, a uh, Oh, I know, Hanna Barbera characters. You can have Fred Flintstone uh, battling Hong Kong Fooey. <laughs> the the thing, my my comment on that question would be, you know, I don't think you have to have characterization in those kind of games, but I don't think you have to ca have characterization in any game, pretty much. But I do think that it will make your game better. 
more like, more branded, and in the end, be more successful. And by more successful, I mean, you know, if you were going to sell seven copies, maybe you sell eight. If you were going to sell three million copies, maybe you sell four or five million copies because of it. You know, more successful doesn't mean successful kind of thing. But like, if you get, if you truly know, like I said, if you truly know character customization or if you truly know characterization, rather, mm -hmm. then you also nailed the the aesthetics. You also nailed the the story. You also nailed all these other things. So, like, because again, you know, to nail customer cust uh, characterization, you, it, there has to be no grinding of gears. All the gears have to mesh well and and put together and you know meaning that you have to know all these other things so if you can nail characterization then you are way way more likely to succeed just because you nailed a lot of things especially the aesthetics mm -hmm. and we all know how much aesthetics goes to selling copies these days and to kind of a t tie a bow on our discussion, again, when we talk about all these aspects, characterization, personalization, world building, lore, and so on, that it's never a case of just one. If you have good personalization, your game will succeed. If your game is good world building, it will succeed. It's a case of how all these elements, that if you think of one, you think of another. And you think of another, you think of the next thing. And it all begins to come together as a cohesive whole. And ultimately, yeah. the goal is that you want to create something that is greater than the sum of its parts. A game right. that is just solid gameplay with poor aesthetics can still be a good game, but it's not going to be as visually or as interesting to somebody staring at it from the outside. And it's probably not going to sell. Yeah. And again, it's why a lot of people look at aesthetics and presentation, value, value it so highly. Because typically, or what we like to see is that if you do have a strong aesthetics, you you thought about characterization. And if you thought about characterization, you thought about world building. And if you thought about world building, then you probably had a thought about UI and UX design. And if you thought about that, then you must know a thing or two about gameplay. And if you know that, then lo and behold, maybe your game is really great. Yep. And the the uh, worm juice made me made me think of something. You know, talking about YouTube and uh, mm -hmm. you know somebody you know the characters showing their personality kind of thing. And you know now we're going to have to break the fourth wall. <laughs> YouTube itself is about characterization because. If 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 you guys know that that people watch a lot of YouTubers because of the 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 personality, the show of personality that they put out, mm. kind of thing. Like it doesn't, and the thing that 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 uh, you know, and same thing goes with Twitch. It's not about the game they're playing. It's about the streamer themselves. It's mm -hmm. about the characterization that they have done in their personal character that is displayed on the the show, which is the reason why they over characterize themselves mm -hmm. a lot of times. And you get these YouTuber reactions. Oh, God, you know, blah, you know, I just you know done something very minor. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're just overreacting to such an extent. You know, to push that personality and characterization to like you know insane levels that makes no sense but like a lot of people get into that kind of thing and a lot of people like that personal you know characterization of themselves and you meet a lot of those people and they are absolutely nothing mm -hmm. like they are on stream because like or, or on their videos I mean like you know PewDiePie does not go PewDiePie like all the time, every time where he goes, unless somebody asks him to say it. But you know, 
and he, he agrees to it. But, like, he, he probably never says it ever except for in his videos and whenever one of his fans asks him to say it and he agrees to. Mm -hmm. So, like, characterization is very important to even YouTube kind of thing. It's it's one of those things that gets us invested and gets us to watch <laughs> kind of thing. And it, it's, it's, you know, and you're watching a video game as well as interacting with it. And if you get that extra characterization in there, then you get that 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 whole cohesive thing and it draws you in. Mm -hmm. yeah, but the <laughs> problem of course is that if you're if you try to keep up a character that is so against your personality, then it can become very stressful and very hard to do that. And mm -hmm. we've seen YouTube burn out because of that. Like for myself as we all know, you know, I'm the opposite. You know, like here I'm calm and, and uh, in control, but in real life I just go running around, you know, getting into fights. You know, I crash cars all the time. You know, I'm just completely wild and crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I, I get so wild and crazy at libraries. <laughs> Lib library has gone wild. There we go. I don't know, like... Like Doom, I think like Doom is an example that they may have went a little too much with Doom Eternal, at least from what I've heard. And that I think is another topic about how do you keep these stories going? Like one of the advantages that Dark Souls has is that while there is a massive, I'm sure, like story by, I'm sorry, world bible for their games, mm -hmm. they can just say, you know what, this game takes place ten thousand years in the future. Who the hell cares what happened in Dark Souls Two? Yeah. You know, you don't need, you know, this character, you know, their story, you know, we don't care about what happened in the next game. It takes place a millennia ago. <laughs> and like I said before, characterization is not just your characters, it is also your world. Mm -hmm. I, I think Doom did so well because of the characterization of the character, because it's very it, subtle. That's what made, I think, stand out. Yeah, it, it was subtle, and it had to be because of the type of game it is. I think that's safely extreme. It subtly stood out. Yeah, that is safely extreme. I mean, you can see the difference between, you know, Doom Guy versus Duke Nukem versus, what was well, it, Lo Wang or Shadow Warrior. Wolfenstein Guy. Yeah. And you, Wolfenstein, there's a example there, you know, between, you know, uh, Blasowitz versus, you know, his daughters and Youngblood. Yeah, I mean, you, you, characterization is always good. It's just, where, where's that line, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. You know, if you over-characterize something, it's, it's like overcooking something. Mm -hmm. If you wonder. If you you undercharacterize and you undercook something like you don't you, you undercook fish and you're going to end up with a soggy mess that might kill you kind of thing. You overcook it, you're going to end up with something dry, cardboard, and probably you're going to throw it away. You got to get it just right, <laughs> and you know that's the important thing about characterization. And you know that's the important thing about a lot of aspects in game development is you you don't have to have all the things. You don't have to have all the things turned up to 11 kind of thing, but you have to have the the each aspect in a acceptable range that will allow you to potentially succeed kind of thing. If it's an unacceptable range, then your chances of succeeding, you're just reducing them. And if you try to do, if you try to force it, mm -hmm. that also hurts as well. <laughs> this is a cool yeah. extreme. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Forcing it would be, you know, kind of overdoing it kind of thing. Yeah. I think that's kind of what we saw with like Doom Eternal. And it's something that we see from a lot of, like the horror genre in particular, I think, suffers from this. That with each game, we have to explain more about what's going on, and you lose that mystery. And kind of, you know, what drove people to the game in the first place. Yeah. 
And to Kinzan's point, you know, maybe we should add a segment in here, you know, the cooking with Sharky segment. Well, we need Chow to come on. He's the one who, he's the chef. <laughs> we need to have some oh. cooking. We need to have him to, like, just, like, cut him in to have a cooking segment. You know, like, when we do, like, like the, the morning shows. You know, here's cooking with Chow. And then back to the game design talks. I guess I'm chopped liver then. <laughs> chopped shark. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right, it's not like I teach my mom how to cook or anything. <laughs> <laughs> you two can do the cooking segments together, and I'll that'll be perfect. Then I can just go, you know, I'll take a break, and I'll come back later. We can do the round table of cooking, gas. There we go. <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll set it up with three windows. You, you'll take the place of you'll you'll probably be in the middle, kind of thing, and then me and Chow on the outsides, kind of thing. <laughs> there we go. All right, but we are, I think, right at time. I think this was a really great cast. I think I do like, I think, going down to having one main topic. I think it allows us to kind of focus more on it. Yeah, especially on short topics like this, according to Josh. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Every short topic is long. Every long topic is short. I was like, no, I think that this one's got some meat to it. They're like, I don't think so. I was like, I think it does. (laughs) Did overcook? I think it did have some. I, the second one has more of a story. I don't remember so much about the first one. Yeah, overcook definitely has characterization. It's just mm-hmm. not a whole lot of characterization, and there's probably a reason behind that because I think that if they put any more behind it, they probably would have overcooked it. That time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but that is going to do it. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in, whether you're enjoying this live or recorded. Be sure to check out our respective Discord channels. they will be linked down below. You can follow me on Twitter, at GWBicer. And where can they find you? Uh, You can find me mainly on Discord. You know, you should come join my Discord. Play Project Triad here on the 18th. You know, um, you know, we, we have our monthly dev chats, although they're now bi-weekly, um, or twice a month, rather. And, you know, you can also find me on Twitter at Nexus Games INC one You can also find me on YouTube on a channel that gets no videos right now, so very limited of how much you find me there. But mm-hmm. there will be videos coming at some point. Hopefully, hopefully it's soon, less than two weeks from now, but, you know... There, there's, there's no promises on that. It could be several more months, but yeah, we're on valve time on videos, kind of thing. But you know, once we start, it's <laughs> probably not going to stop. All right, and I will be back later tonight for our nightly streams and our shows. For those of you watching this recorded, are Sunday starting around 4 p.m. EDT. So, everyone, have a great rest of your weekend and come back for delayed discussions on game design here and on game wisdom, where some of you are in science of games. All right, have a great night, everybody, and see you next time. See ya.